everybody, and welcome to a childish Wild Ride with Steve-O. We've got Josh Peck, a prolific child star. He got into stand-up comedy at the age of 10 because his mom made him. And he also got into some pretty heavy substance abuse. And we don't shy away from the juicy war stories about that. Plus, speaking of substances, the cops interrupted the episode because they thought something sketchy was going on with the hoses running in and out of the RV like we were cooking something we weren't supposed to. Pretty, pretty wild. And we were definitely talking about a lot of sketchy stuff. So strap on your seatbelts and let's get into it. Okay. So we're ready we're, to go. We're recording everywhere. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Peck. Yeah. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. Man, we connected. God, it's been four years yeah. since we first connected and we exchanged numbers and like texted semi-regularly, always planning to meet up and do something, and it took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it seems like it always does in this town. Was that when you, he came to the house? Yeah. And that was four years ago? Yeah, hmm. four, four years ago. But I'd seen you around kind of on campus yeah, of, yeah, the, okay. of the sobriety crew, and I, uh, but I never wanted to approach because it just felt because I, I literally was like, because it's so, I think we have like about a, we're about a month apart in sobriety. I think it's more like a week. I'm March 10th, 08. Yeah, I'm the fe February 15th. Okay. Oh, I'm February so, 10th. Yeah? I'm, yeah. Mar I'm, I'm but, March but he's 1st. the same year. The right? same year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're both 15 years yeah. sober. And I, I was like, all right, so we have similar times, so it's not like I'm, I'm putting my hand out to a newcomer necessar necessarily. So I was just like, <laughs> what's my motives here? Is it just because I'm a big fan? Because <laughs> if so, I'll let him be. And I did. Ah, well, man. It's a good way to look at it. What's your motives? <laughs> that, you that, that, that answers a, everything. That is a really good way to look at everything. Um, that uh, time four years ago, we recorded your, your podcast, which was audio only. Yeah. And now you've got a new podcast, which has the video, the audio, the everything. Like, And we're double uploading. Double up. So let's not tread on the same subject matter that we did on your podcast. <laughs> what are we getting into? <laughs> Conspiracy theories. So that everybody can enjoy both well, podcasts. What did you guys talk about? <laughs> Anything uh, controversial controversial, or, or clickbaity? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, sounds about right. <laughs> I mean, I uh, okay, so the, walk me back to where uh, it's 2008 and you're getting sober. Yeah. At that point, you're how old? 21. 21 years old. And um, I I understand you were a full-on child star. Is that fair to say? Sure. Okay. At what age did you become famous? I guess I, I would say I started working. I started working in New York as a stand-up comedian when I was 10. Wow. And I got my first job which was a show called The Amanda Show, which was like sketch comedy for kids. Amanda Bynes, like crazy brilliant. Oh, wow. Beyond her years talent, still is. And I was 13 and that moved me out to California. And in that day and age, basically the runway was, if you were remotely funny and you were on one kid's show, you were probably going to get a show with your name in it too. Yeah. And Keenan and Kel had been off for a couple of years. They needed another buddy comedy and here comes Drake and Josh. It blows my mind that a ten-year-old is going on stage and to, to be funny, right? What, what kind of what kind of jokes does a ten-year-old have? Observational, baby. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's the deal with uh, fruit roll-ups? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you remember any of your actual jokes from when you were 10? No, I, I remember making, I made fun of my mom. I made fun of kids at school. Mm -hmm. I, I did impress, I did bad, probably like Billy Madison impressions. And, but I had a tight five and I would go to these <laughs> comedy <tight> clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's so great. To You're, a 10 year old is really one minute, but it felt like yeah, five minutes. Probably just the audience being nice to me and not wanting to cut my head off. Where were you, who, who, what was your audience? School or like older people? So I found this agent named Sid Gold, Gold Star Entertainment, the father of Elon Gold, the great comedian. And okay. uh, 
I was reading this newspaper. I was nine years old, and I would just do like kids theater and whatnot at school, school plays and whatnot. But like any kid who plays little league dreams of being in the major leagues, I would like look around at these kids in my school play, and I'd be like, "You guys got to get your fucking game up!" <laughs> like <laughs> you really are. like because I was so I loved it. And they just did it for fun, and they were probably much healthier about it, but I wanted to do it at a high level. So I, I'm reading this magazine for actors called Backstage. There's this guy, Sid Gold. I represent performers of all ages. And I said, well, I qualify. <laughs> 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 and I go to his office, he's like, well, I, I represent comedians, and if you can get five minutes together, I will put you up at Caroline's Comedy Club. Wow. Yeah, and that's how it started. Wow. Yeah. Were um, you nervous, like, uh, getting on stage at that young of an age? I think it's like skateboarding or anything like where the under, like, I, I, I tried skiing for the first time at 30, and I quickly was like, this is insane. Like, this is so dangerous. This is no way to learn something. And so, like, anything like that, I, I feel like it's better to learn young because your understanding of risk and pain is so much lower. Okay. I just like, with stand up, I just was like, I, I yeah, I, I certainly was nervous. And I would know if one, one performance went better than the other, but I was a little fearless. Yeah. I would say, yeah. That's, That's cool. great, man. How often did you perform your type five? Twice a week. <laughs> Twice a week for Whoa. how long? Five years. Wow. And same material? No, I would update a little bit I, because then I would also cash it out because I'd go perform on. Rosie O'Donnell or Wow oh, really right. was Tight five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eventually yeah. got to a tight ten. And I'd be like, I gotta get back to work. You yeah. know, I gotta throw out the old bitch. Okay, yeah. so. But that was ten and then you started doing uh Josh and Drake, Drake and Josh at twelve. No, and not until I was about fifteen. I did oh. Amanda show at thirteen. Right. Okay. Yes. And and when are you performing stand up comedy on the Rosie O'Donnell show? This is a great story. So I'm like 10 years old and my mom's like typical Jewish mother and we just go to see the Rosie O'Donnell show. But at that time she would have people from the audience introduce her. So there's this guy running around in a headset, right? My mom being like, I'm not standing in line. <laughs> 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 yeah. She goes, come here. <laughs> She's like, got a young comedian here. You need him. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, well, give me a joke. I told him a joke. Five minutes later, we're in the green room of the Rosie O'Donnell show. Wow. And then my mom's like, well, we didn't get this far to get this far. Like, you're going to tell her after you introduce her that you're a kid comedian and you want to sing a song and do a bit with her. And I was like, yes, mom. Just love me. <laughs> and where's dad? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly what happened. Wow. Yeah. So how was it received on, on Rosie, and, and how much of, uh, of a bit did you get to do? I did a joke, I sang with her, we did like some Broadway show tune, something that was in my key, in my register, and uh, you know, it, at that time, it was just so, I was just always ready to go, like whether it was, Catch a Rising Star, Stand Up New York called, and they've got five minutes tonight if you want to come in and sub in. So my mom would be like, take a nap, because you're not <laughs> going up till, till midnight. Oh, and wow. they're going to have to sneak you in through the back. It was like, I was always ready to go at that time. It was my thing. What year was that? Um, 90, it was probably like 95 through... Wow. Uh, two, I mean, all the way, I moved to LA in 2000. We're, okay. Um... It, Presumably, to do this bit on the Rosie O'Donnell show, like there was a rehearsal. No, no rehearsal. <laughs> no rehearsal. So just on the fly, mm -hmm. and in order to sing a song, you're not doing it a cappella, right? Like uh, he, she had an, a her kind of Andy Richter was this this uh, great pianist who was like a classically trained Broadway pianist. So he could play anything. So it was like if you gave him anything within like the last 40 years of the the Rodgers and Hammerstein songbook, he was ready to go. Wow. And, and I just remember, I remember, I think I remember the intro was like, hi, I'm Josh Peck and this is a Rosie O'Donnell show on today's show. Uh, <laughs> Mike Myers. Wow. Robert Wagner. 
and John Cicada. Hit it, John. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that that's it. He, oh, you'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> and there you go. Wow. <laughs> and cut it. <laughs> That's really yeah, cool. That's fantastic. After you did that, th was your phone ringing? Did you get more gigs from that, or I I didn't, but I I would audition at Nickelodeon every day for something like a commercial or uh, two lines on a on one of their shows. They had their offices. I'm sure where you've been a million times at 1515 Broadway. Santa, oh, 15, I was thinking of Santa Monica, but yeah, yeah, uh, in New okay, York, yeah, New York, because it was MTV and TRL right. shot there, and and so. I would just get really close, but they they really never wanted me. I would audition for this show, All That, which was like SNL for kids. The best show. Hold the phone, folks. There's a brand new sponsor of the Wild Ride podcast, and I'm claiming it is all that. It's called Miracle Made. They make bed sheets, which are inspired by NASA. I'm telling you, it's incredible. They're infused with silver, which regulates the temperature so you're always sleeping comfortably at the perfect temperature. And the way that they're infused with silver prevents the growth of over 90% of bacteria so these sheets stay fresher, longer, no gnarly odors. And they're silky and satiny, more comfortable than anything. I'm telling you, I love them. And if you go to trymiracle.com slash Stevo and use the promo code Stevo, man, you're going to get over 40% off your order. And at checkout, you're going to get a three towel set totally for free, plus an extra 20% off your order. I'm telling you, this deal is all that. The sheets are incredible. So sleep like a king by going to trymiracle.com slash Stevo and use the promo code Stevo. Now let's get back to it. It's my dream. Yeah, all that was so good. I wanted it so bad. Yeah. And they were like, you're not ready, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't want me. And But I find, I booked this movie with Chevy Chase and Chris Elliott and Iggy Pop and wow. Pam Greer. Whoa. And it was a Nickelodeon movie called Snow Day. And I'm on set and the president of Nickelodeon's hanging out. And my mom, being who she is, was like, tell him you want to be on all that. Tell him you love this shit. Give him a joke. And I did. And nine months later, he called and said, I'm moving you and your mom to California. You're on The Amanda Show. Congratulations. Whoa. And so that, sick. That changed your You're life. You're like, The Amanda Show? Bullshit, man. I wanted to be on all that. Yeah, I really did. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> Not until I got there and I was like, yo. Because at 13, amongst my friends, I was certainly like maybe the most talented kid and then you go into like a ring with amanda Bynes, and you're like i i have nothing on you like you're yeah. so much wow. further ahead of me um now w when you were going to 1515 broadway like just on a regular basis just showing up and just trying to whose motivation was it was it like you telling your mom mom i want to go and 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 just show up at the building or was it your mom saying josh we're going to go show up at the building both <laughs> <laughs> in hindsight both but, but, you know i loved it and i was I, I i was pretty good and so it was your mom it was my mom. <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing she's an un my mom's crazy talented beautiful singing voice like like my mom is marvelous Mrs. Mizell if she stayed married, right? Okay. Like and didn't become like, uh, you know, a stand up. And so when she saw it in her kid, she's like, well, I'm going to give you everything I wish I had. So basically like I started it, like I started a small fire and she just shot, you know, kerosene mm -hmm. all over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. But I was watching the Burt Kreischer podcast and it was, you guys were talking about how much you made during your four seasons of doing that. What I'm curious about is when you become a childhood star, is there any, do they teach you about taxes or like, is there a learning <laughs> curve with like most kids when they become a childhood star and they start making this money? Like what, what do you do with all that money? I don't know. We're not on, there's no support group, but there should be, there should be a child star anonymous. That'd be a good show. I guess it's like celebrity rehab. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there's no one really teaching you. And I think you just have to like hope that you meet the right people and hope you have like a semi trustworthy parent, which in this business is 50 50 with mm -hmm. kid, kid actors. But luckily my mom to a certain extent understood like, 
You, you got to pay taxes. Yeah, like let's hold back half of every paycheck to make sure at the end of the year we're taken care of. Were you getting homeschooled or were you also going to like regular middle school, high school while filming? I went to a continuation <clears throat> school called Options for Youth. I love when people are like, where'd you go to high school? I'm like, Options for Youth. <laughs> they're like, who was your mascot? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, they're like, what went wrong, right? Um, and it was great, but it was for kids who did not fit into the standard school system system mm -hmm. so it was teen moms gang members and child actors. stars <laughs> yeah. wow. wow that's that's and is that a public school yeah it is my okay. brother went to continuation where's your brother today is he okay he's doing yeah. great yeah. 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 he's actually got 15 years over too no way yeah, yeah. is it uh, okay to say that yeah okay good. he doesn't mm -hmm. care you know yeah um now, uh, you move out to California. You're in continuation school in California. Yeah. And is uh, the gang element, the drug addict element, like, introduced from school? Like, I'm assuming that there's, like, a, a drug element. That it was North Hollywood, picture. right? North Hollywood. It's exactly right. Like, like That's where, where I grew up. It was rough at the loaded. time. It was a rough area. I mean... I think that's the one thing that sometimes misunderstood is like I lived I moved from a 500 square foot apartment with a bedroom with no windows in New York with like a, a single mom who understandably like it's just it's a bitch being a parent regardless but doing it on your own and and we just didn't have a lot of money and then we moved here and we had a little more but it wasn't crazy yeah and uh, and so we moved into a two bedroom apartment uh, in North Hollywood in like an elevated Oakwood and it was, I mean, it was 1800 a month. And I, I literally thought we were in a palace. We were. Like, we had a pool. We had a racquetball court. I'm like, I didn't know I was Elon Musk. Like, this is <laughs> stunning. And I stayed there from 14 to 29. Because it was so... I got my mom a nice place when I was 18. But I stayed because I'd never lived in... A one thousand square foot apartment for eighteen hundred bucks a month. Whoa! Um, so yeah. So anyway, that the area though it was super transient and weird because no one lives in these places sixteen years. They live there six months. So I just remember like drugs and all like that seedy underbelly stuff. It wasn't really at school, and I wasn't exposed to it on set like the Hollywood stuff as much. It just like was slowly around. And my best friends who weren't actors, like the people I would just hang out with after school just it's so it's so trite that it's it's gross because it's just somebody started smoking weed and then weed was the thing and then somebody tried something harder and then that became the thing even though we all told ourselves we'd only be potheads for the rest of our lives what was the something harder well i mean i had friends who were you know smoking speed in warehouses i i didn't go that far but yeah. i mean it's they're north hollywood kids who didn't you know there wasn't a lot of foundational support there. Right. Were you hanging out with other kids in North, like celebrities in the, the, Joseph Gordon Lovett's from like Van Nuys, North Hollywood area? Right. Or did you guys ever link up or in continuation? Were there any other actors? No, no. I mean, I always had actor friends. I remember I started going to to, to acting class um, when I was fifteen. Thank God, because I had like a manager who was like, "You're not good." And I was like, babe, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm like, are you seeing all the razzle dazzle I'm putting on these jokes? <laughs> I'm like, I have a show with my name on it. And she's like, yeah, but you're not good. Like, you're a fucking shtick machine. Like, you're a forward energy, dad, please love me, like, broken shtick monster. Whoa. And that's not going to work anywhere but where you are right now. And that's proven to be correct. No, um, <laughs> so I, uh, and so she's like, you got to go to acting class. And so I went and thank God I fell in love with it because I'm kind of at my heart just an acting geek anyway. And in that class was Evan Rachel Wood, Dakota Fanning, Penn Badgley, Evan Peters, like all these killers. But, you know, they weren't who they are today. They were just like me, like young actors who wanted to be better. And it was there where I was like, oh, maybe I can do this forever because... I really fell in love with it on a deeper level then. And and you were pretty pudgy? I was a heavy boy. I was a thick I was a thick boy, yes. <laughs> yeah. What if I just denied it? I was like, no. <laughs> I don't know what you're 5, talking 10, about. 145. <laughs> I'm the resting team. Uh, um 
So, you, you fall in love with acting. When did, when did you start going to this acting class? I was like 14 years old and it became my like, you know, I was twice, I would, I would go once a week and then I would help like teach. And by that, I mean, I was, I would, there was a younger kids class that they would have the 15, 16 year olds come and like assist with the eight and nine year old kids who were taking class. And, and it was just, it was my foundation. It was my, my, uh, social life. I've told this story before, so I'm not, I don't think I'm speaking out of school, but I, the first, my first like real kiss was during a game of spin the bottle with Evan Rachel Wood. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. And it was ridiculous. And God bless her for, for being willing to kiss a, a young boy who wanted to know what that felt like. Um, but yeah, yeah I was dude. 16. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Shout out Evan. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So were, were any, I mean, without throwing anybody under the bus, was there weed being smoked in the acting class? No, those kids were all good kids. It was my, it was my street rat North Hollywood contingent. It okay. was my, still my best friend to this day. Shout out Len. What about right. Nickelodeon? Were you guys like sneaking off, getting high, and then going back and filming? Some were. I wasn't. Like in general, like I mean, like Nickelodeon kid stars of that day. Like I'm sure. Shia LaBeouf. Amanda Bynes. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda's so great, man. She's just like, I, uh, she's such a great person. And then also just selfishly, I think she's literally one of the greatest performers. Like I, I just, I want to watch her do more stuff, but she's, she's awesome. But yeah, dude, I mean, there were so many, I, I think I was like weirdly the exception, but because I was a, a thick, thick boy, I, it weirdly like saved me in the ways that I never felt, even though I, I had a show with my name in it, I didn't feel a part of that crowd. Like that was a different level than me. Like these cool kid actors who would go to events and clubs and look chic and maybe were partying. Like I felt comfortable amongst my group of, of buddies who were going to Grant High School and were just like doing normal knucklehead shit that kids do. Not like the famous Hollywood kids. Yeah. There's a lot of like child stars that have stories about being bullied because they're stars and I yeah. can never figure that out but was that a thing? Yeah. Now, I don't think there are a lot of child stars in my audience. I think you guys are adults and there's a good possibility that you're getting bullied into paying way too much for shaving products. Products with gimmicks that you don't need like vibrating handles. It's just silly. And let me tell you about Harry's. Harry's makes super quality five blade razors, weighted ergonomic handles, nothing that you don't need. It's classy, it's what I use. And you can get this starter kit. It's the craft handle set with this killer new craft handle, five blade razor, foaming shave gel, the travel cover to protect it all everything that you need it's a value of 17 dollars, and they're going to give it to you for only 10 dollars. if you go to harrys.com slash stevo i'm telling you man these are the razors that i use i've been using them for years i love this company so go to harrys.com slash stevo to get your craft handle set right now for just 10 bucks all right, now let's get back to it. I, I went to performing arts high school in New York. And <coughs> when I moved to LA, my, we didn't know where to go. My mom's like, I've heard of this place, Beverly Hills. I think that's nice. So we moved into a, uh, uh, like a little apartment in Beverly Hills for nine months. And I go to middle school there while I'm doing the Amanda show. And I'm used to performing arts high school where they're literally like, whatever you need, the bigger the opportunity, the better. We'll make it easy. I walk into this normal school where they're like, you're not coming for three weeks? <laughs> like, yeah. you have algebra. And I'm like, I got song and dance. <laughs> like, I can't make it. And they were like, then you fail. Like, we're not helping you to skip school for months on end. And those kids sucked. Yeah. Those kids were really shitty in me. And I was like, oh, this isn't for me. I'll go to school with the teen moms. Okay. My people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my sister was going to school with the uh, the oldest son on um, Tool Time, where um, Zachary Ty Bryant. Yeah, Solid. so they're they're we all know each other. No, <laughs> <really>? <laughs> no, no, no. no, I remember she was going to high school with him, and it was a trip seeing him. Like you know, when he was in ninth grade, it's like, oh, dude, that. But like when he goes to a party, people are just like, fuck this guy. Not because they uh, know they? him, but because they're jealous. You know, it's like this guy's yeah. on TV and just 
people want to hate at that age. So. Oh yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, were you were, were you feeling that like when you go to high school parties? Uh, yeah, it was it, it was odd. I mean, as as long ago as like in the last ten years, my wife's younger sister was going to to com, uh, to a college in in San Luis Obispo, and they wound up. I was like twenty seven at the time, and they're they're having some party, and it's a bunch of like college seniors, and I'm there with my wife, like f- feeling like a chaperone, <laughs> and some kid like really wanted to fight me. And I was like, wow. I, I, I'd want to fight me too. <laughs> but why? Because I'm fucking Josh Peck. And what was I doing? There? <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. So, so then you get the, the Drake and Josh show. And at that point, you're like pretty into the just being loaded. No, no, it oh. wasn't till the last. I was 15. <laughs> Great question. Uh, <laughs> l- uh, last, l- the, the last season is where sort of the wheels fell off. Where I was, I was, I was sowing my wild oats, as they say. But How many seasons were there? Just four. Okay. And and and, and a season per year. Yeah, about a season per year, and it wasn't very popular. Um, when it was on, it's only like become very popular over the last like 10 years just because of social media. And, and it, it just, uh, people who were, you know, young when they watched it at the time that it was on TV, they got older and then their little sisters and brothers watched it and mm-hmm. then theirs did, you know what I mean? So it's weird. Yeah. I mean, there's no like syndication, like money or any of that, right. but, but I mean, it's just, yeah, they just air it a bunch. Right. Do you not get so you don't get paid for syndication? No, there's no residuals in kids TV. It, are you there's getting no residuals in Jackass? <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, not for the TV show. Not for the TV no show. No way. Yeah, I never saw a penny for for. You know, they still play all that. Anybody in Tremaine pocketing that? Th- no, I mean, I, 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 don't, I would doubt yeah. it. Like I would, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I, don't know I would doubt sure, it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 wait, guys, is Spike Jones doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure Spike's okay. But are the producers of the show getting? I'm sure. <laughs> it's just not the actors. I don't know. I, yeah, it just was. We were we worked for the same company. I think it was just kind Viacom, of a, yeah. a, a different different kind of deal back then. Yeah, basic cable. <laughs> um, so the last season of Drake and Josh, then the, you're 17, 18? Yes. 17, 18. A- and at that time, what year is it? It's uh, 2005. Okay. Yeah. So jo- Drake and Josh ends, and then, and, and the, you, you're kind of getting speed wobbles because you're totally loaded. But... <laughs> Uh, after Jake, Drake and Josh, are you working? I was. I went and did this Judd Apatow movie like right after. And again, that was on some stand-up when I was 10 years old shit. I remember auditioning for that movie. It was called Drillbit Taylor playing a bully. And on the ride there, I go, I think I'm going to do a Dice impression for my entire audition. An Andrew Dice Clay impression. Like, no one... It's a strong choice. It's a heavy claim. <laughs> no one goes like, maybe you do one line in a dice voice. Like, gay! Like, you don't do the whole thing like, hey! Like, and I did the whole thing in a dice impression. And literally, like, it was one of those moments where I think I was so fearless that they were, they were like, this was either genius or terrible. But we'll go with genius. And I get this part, and I'm doing this thing, and it was great, except... I was like 19 and being a knucklehead cliche and I just didn't, I didn't show up for the opportunity. And that was sort of like the beginning of, of the, the, of the quick, you know, express train, the sobriety. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was not a proud one. So you you did get the part though. Yeah. I got the part. I did it, but I just was, I didn't show up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the movie. You can see it. Yeah. You're just saying you didn't show up. You were there a hundred percent. No, it was a great opportunity, and it's not like Judd Apatow likes funny Jewish guys. <laughs> like, it's not like I was perfectly set up to yeah. make the kind of relationship that could have paid dividends for the rest of my life. No, I just, I wasn't, I just wasn't there, and I didn't know. I was, I had just finished this thing that had defined me for the last eighteen years, and like most kids at that age, I wanted to have my college experience and not have to worry about supporting my mom or not have to worry about, 
you know, doing something that was going to hurt me in the public eye. And to an extent, I had that. But unfortunately, I had this like grown up job where I needed to show up for people and I didn't. So luckily, Judd, who was incredibly cool then, is still incredibly cool. And we've chatted about it since. And thankfully, I've been able to make an amends. And it's all good. You know, the movie didn't suffer just because good old JP didn't bring his A game. <laughs> but, um, but it was a good, it, it taught me a lot. Nice, dude. So, <laughs> so you're totally loaded <laughs> yeah. after this movie, and uh, like, is there is there an intervention where people step in and say, "Dude, like, you know, we're losing you." It was so many instances. It was like so many mini bottoms of just like morally and emotionally, just feeling like. To your point that we talked about earlier, like I was um, because I was a heavier kid. I had seen, there was a lot of data, like had I just started messing around with stuff at 18, like I probably would have had to put together a stronger portfolio against myself, you know, like a, uh, a stronger defense of saying like, hey, bud, it's clearly yeah. not working out. But I literally had 10 years of data saying, Josh, you overdo it. No matter what it is, you overdo it. Like you aren't like your fellows. And... And it started with, you know, me being heavier when I was younger. And then I got in shape and I thought I'd hit this finish line. But of course, I had the same mind. And so I just needed something, something different. So when I found, you know, <clears throat> uh, sort of uh, all, all the, the tricks and trades of, of the things that people like us like to indulge in, it was like, it was a wrap. I was like, oh, this is so much better and so, such fewer calories. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't know that... Uh heard of the things we do in recovery as indulgent <laughs> but yeah it, 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 it's it's way better did, did i hear you right that you said you got in shape before you got sober yeah oh wow i lost uh, yeah i lost a considerable amount before wow I, I was under the impression that it was a more recent thing that you had your transformation no no like uh, almost 20 three, years ago 300 pounds as a kid i was a big boy yeah. <laughs> yeah. My wife keeps saying, like, you don't have to talk about it that much. I'm like, the people, they love it. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you know, you're never going to escape it if you keep talking about it. I'm like, it's a good podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> Just put my old face right here. Yeah. Hey, Vinny, dude, dude, does this give you hope for the future? I mean, yeah, for sure. But I'm also, like... I also go in excess with everything I do, even in sobriety, but it's like... We, we pulled up to the skate park, <laughs> and I remember we were... The last conversation we had before the, I saw you at the skate park, you were like, dude, I only eat like... 1500 calories a day like i don't get it let me pull up and you're eating a pizza and i'm like is that part of your 1500 calories a yeah, day yeah yeah i mean dude so the conversation i don't know i forgot who the guest was um a couple weeks ago but you guys said that you never see an old overweight person yeah that hit me so hard yeah because like they're like oh you see old people smoking with their oxygen machines but you don't mm -hmm. really see an overweight old person well, let me tell you folks, being an old person on a ventilator doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun either. And I think we all know there are habits that we can let go of to avoid having that happen. And the way to drop a bad habit is to replace it with a new good one. And that's what this company, Fume, is all about. Fume is a device which uses essential oils to flavor air. And I'm telling you, man, I don't even really have any particular bad habit I'm trying to quit. I just really enjoy my fume. I have it in my pocket all the time, and I just, I, I like it. Plus, it's super helpful, man. This company's been helping people let go of bad habits for a long time, and they can help you. Go to tryfume.com slash Stevo and use the promo code Stevo at checkout to get 10% off the journey pack. I think you guys know who you are who need to do this. So do it. And let's get back to it. Yeah, it's true. Sure. I know. And I, like I, the, I started thinking, I was like, wait, you're right. I don't, you don't really see overweight old people. So that like really hit me hard. And I was like, okay, I really need to do something. But it's just so fucking hard, dude. I'm just like... I'm at home and I just like, I'm like, okay, I'm hungry and I'll think of something, I want to eat something and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't eat that. But then I eat it anyway and, and then afterwards I feel shame. Why and, is it in the house? 
Because <laughs> I get it, you know? Like, Because I, <laughs> I bought it. Food is awesome. Yeah, because food, food is the best. Thing. And it's like, I don't know, dude, it's just tough. It's tough. You know? It's the By toughest the way, thing. All three of us are in the cult. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. cult. We're, we're, yeah. we're all in the. the the indulgent brotherhood. <laughs> yeah. The indulgent brotherhood. Yeah. Yeah. Does, what, is, what does your audience think about the cult? You know, um, I, I don't like make a point of like, hey, let's get together and talk about sobriety, but mm. it just comes up, yeah. you know, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And when it does come up, I feel like uh, people really resonate with it, or maybe it's just because like that the people who it does resonate with, they'll speak up. Mm. But I, I kind of get uncomfortable talking about recovery um, because it, it gets turned into, like, TikTok clips, you it know? And like, does. And, 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 you know, when speaking about recovery is the primary purpose of an interview, like, I don't want to be a part of it, you know? like I agree. I, 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 I get weirded out by recovery media because I just feel like it tangles up the wires so I, I don't shy away from it when it does come up um, but I, I don't try to lead with it I think that's probably the perfect way I when I I wrote a book that came out last year and, and I too was faced with that like dichotomy you of, sent me a copy of the book yeah 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 <clears throat> and, what's it called uh, happy people are annoying that's yeah. right I remember I have it I love that name that's great Thanks. I, I And I didn't know how to, you know, sort of uh, touch on this subject that's such a big chapter of my life and very much has its hands in my entire life, but especially like the last 15 years. And then I just realized like I can just sort of talk about my experience in a general way yeah. and then and hope that if it can resonate in all great. And if not, then I just kind of told my, my side of things. But I always want to give the disclaimer of like, I'm not a representative. Right. You know? Um, and and it, it occurs to me too that on the Moby podcast, we went way into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, got yeah. a lot of time, right? Yeah, he's same a month apart. Yeah, yeah, same amount no of time. Yeah. yeah. Moby, oh, wait, 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 no, he's six months, he came in six months after me. Gotcha. So you've got seven months on him, but we're all same year. right there. Yeah. He's um. Do you find and here I go going deep into yeah. sobriety. You find uh, a lot of guys you or people you got sober with not sober anymore. Yeah, I mean the the success rate's pretty bad, right? I yeah. mean, uh, I, I I got the same crew, <laughs> you know. Really? <clears throat> yeah, like uh, you know Tommy, like. Scott, like, like I just think that the people who really stick together, yeah, you know, get it. You know, I think if I wasn't working <clears throat> with you this whole time, like I would have had a lot more struggling hmm. because it's like I, I, <clears throat> I would have been held accountable or like you just showed up for a job. But if I was like working some bullshit job, just like fuck, what's the point? You know, who knows? Like if I didn't stick to it, I probably would have had a beer easy. You yeah, know? but yeah, it's interesting. It's great to have uh, like a real crew around you. Yeah. What was the uh, the last day of using like for you? It, nothing special, and maybe that was the problem, right? It just like it it turned into a lot like Groundhog Day. And yeah. Days looking incredibly similar, and just being like massively disappointing to a massive amount of people regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and first and foremost, as I've talked about throughout this pod, like just sort of breaking my mom's heart on a regular basis. And I, I had, you know, and then there's also the part of it too, where it's like the only through line of my life that I can tell you for sure is like when I was nine years old, I fell in love with acting and that's why I joined that school play. And that's why I do it uh, as cool as a Christopher Nolan movie, or I do it on Drake and Josh, or I do or this is just another version of performance, right? Yeah. Like, it's all like, I'll do it anywhere all the time. Or, or why I was at... Hey, I'm so sorry. I just shot a text, but this guy just needs to look in to make sure there's nothing sketchy happening in here. <laughs> all right. We got, we got a cop looking in to make sure nothing <laughs> sketchy happening in here. Yeah, Sir, do you want to be interviewed? Please sketch. <laughs> yeah, right on, great. man. Yeah, it must look sketchy with Sorry. like the air conditioning yeah. pumping in. It's like we have a Breaking Bad meth yeah. lab. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that was epic.
Perfect. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious. It's my yeah, I mean, I mean, look, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at it. We do have a, like a machine outside with a hose pumping in. Who fucking knows? Yeah, that's so. Fu I wasn't even sure you knew Isaac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I like the best. Off, I still stress out, even though I know I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, it still stresses me out. I would. I got pulled over the other day by a motorcycle cop with my son in the car, and I was like, in this was such a like a sober dad moment I'm like my son is about to see compliance like he's never seen <laughs> I'm like good morning sir <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I got pulled over with my son I was like hey son hide this meth pipe <laughs> <laughs> what was it like uh, when um, we were in uh, when we were in uh, New Orleans there's this this like homeless kid outside and he goes dude let me tell you a joke. Yeah, he had a... And, uh -huh. and he says, man, like, it's not cool to smoke meth around babies, but if you put a plastic bag over their head, then they won't breathe it in. <laughs> yeah, you put that on your story. <laughs> that was the funniest. I'm like, dude, I think I gave him like 20 bucks. Yeah. But, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was one of the best jokes of all time. Um... Okay, so, uh, what, um, what was going on before you linked up with David Dobrik? Like, <coughs> sorry, did you have, like, like, let me ask it a different way. Was there, like, consistent work the whole time? Or, like, did the, like the conventional kind of corporate Viacom and Judd Apatow structure of entertainment like fade out and then like you had a digital resurrection with YouTube? I, so I, I had been really lucky to be working, you know, consistently, but the thing about it was like, I just had a, nor I knew that what I had was just like a normal journeyman actor's career, right? So maybe once a year I would work for two months on something and sometimes it was dope and sometimes it was like an indie no one saw and then what keeps you going is you go on 20 auditions a year and you know you get callbacks on 25% of them and then maybe one of them you test on and maybe one you get maybe one you test but like again and Matt Damon just there was this great clip that he talked about like for an actor just the callback says so much to you because it's like I'm close you know like I'm in the ballpark I'm doing something right and then if you test like all the there's all these subtle indicators you have to take because for a lot of us the job doesn't come you know and but the the mass public doesn't see that right they just see like these year gaps where they're like where are where are you what are you doing what are you up to so I, I got big on social media like in 2013, inadvertently with the Vine app. Were you on Vine? I messed around with it a little bit, but I, I, you would have, you would have crushed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. Um, was it like five seconds and you could like piece it together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it was six pretty cool, Like pretty cool little editing software built into that app. Yeah. It was it was great, and I just did it for fun because I liked watching comedians on there. And within a year, I was like the number one person on it. Even more than Brittany Furlon, I think for a, for a while, and then she lapped me and King Batch yeah. and all the people who became yeah. massive on it. But it built this thing for me, and I remember in 2014, I had tested. I I like it was between me and this other actor. For the, I've talked about this story, so I'll just say it. I remember I like got like a. It was between me and <coughs> Rami Malik for this show, Mr. Oh, wow. Robot. Oh wow! And I remember like, and I just remember, and I was starting to do Vine then, and like it was getting popular. But I'm like, fuck, I was like, when I book this show, I'll never Vine again. <laughs> like, you ain't, you're not gonna fucking catch me on Vine. And uh, and of course I don't get it. And of course Rami got it because he was perfect and so good in it. And uh, and I feel comfortable saying that because I lost in, in that bet. And I just remember, like, a day later, I get a, a a brand hits me up in some emails. Like, we'll give you a couple grand to do this thing on Vine if you want. And it was, like, legit. It wasn't online gambling. And I was like, okay. 
and I did it and I like made, it was the first time I'd made money outside of the showbiz structure. And, it, and how incredible it felt to A, be able to make content for people without asking permission and B, not having to like audition five times in front of 30 casting directors and producers and like singing for my soup that I've been doing since I was 10. It was like revelatory. And I was like, if I do a couple of these a month, suddenly like I'm not rich, but I don't have to sweat it. Like and I can take care of my mom and like maybe marry my girl. Like, yeah. so I leaned in. And it became great. And then I booked a TV show with John Stamos playing his son on Fox a year later. And I leaned out. And I was oh, like, wow. I knew it. <laughs> I don't have to be on the internet anymore. And I did that for a year. And it only went one season. And I leaned back in. Because again, it was a lot of this ego fighting itself, right? Like, how do I want to be perceived? What do I want to want people to think of me? And... But I knew that, again, I just liked creating. I didn't really, if you really ask me, I didn't care whether it was on my phone or in front of, you know, on some fancy TV show on Fox. So that leaves me, that show doesn't get picked up. It's like 2016. And it was the end of the, the year. And I just was like disillusioned. I'm like, I've been doing this almost 20 years. And it's just so annoying. I have such little power. And our friend Jason Nash calls me. He's like, I'm working with this kid, David Dobrik. He's pretty funny. He has an idea for a bit. Do you want to come over and shoot it? We did. It was fun. It was easy. We did it in an hour. What year was that? It was like December <clears throat> 2016. And I just remember thinking, if he calls me to do something again, I'll do it. And he called me every day for two years. Like, wow. I didn't know it turned into shooting, like, literally every other day for a couple of years. But, yeah, it just was this, again, like, many days it was people like Jason and me and you came around, like, yeah. smart, funny people who were like, here's a bit, let's troubleshoot it, let's pitch jokes and you felt like you were accomplishing something and then you were also growing and then brand deals followed and suddenly it was like kind of a interesting ecosystem so it was like a fun weird side job for two years god it's crazy how big that got man yeah. really bad that, that how uh, did you feel the i mean because it was the first time when you did the roof bit well no the first time i met david dobrik was I want to say 2015. It was 2015 for sure. And it was uh, like a brand deal company um, reached out. They they had a, like, go watch this movie and post about the movie. 22 Jump Street? Not 22 Jump Street. It was, And there were a I bunch of different movies. Did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, those are actually fun. They're okay. I no, like, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, they're great. I, I like them. I, I, like, I, I maybe, maybe shouldn't say this, but it, it, it seemed to uh, be an indicator, like, like almost a trend, that when a movie wasn't tracking well and it was getting ready to really flop, they would bring in the influencers great. to try to, like, you know, throw a little money at the influencers and have them, like... You know, like, it, 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 it wasn't a good sign for the movie's prospects that they were paying us to go see it and post about it. And, um... Not a lot of Mandalorian influencers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what movie it was, and I'm, of course, in this context, I wouldn't want to say it, but um, I went to a movie, and David Dobrik was one of the influencers. But at that time, he wasn't, like, really big. Like, not, you know... And I remember this company, too, that, that booked me for that. They were like, dude, this kid David Dobrik, like, is blowing up. And at, this is after that. Wow. But I had just a little bit of interaction with them, and, and uh, you know, I can't remember if we exchanged numbers, but, like, they, we had a favorable impression of each other. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, then... I don't know when the, the thing was, but he reached out, says, dude... I'm filling up uh, my swimming pool with dry ice. Like, uh, you want to, like, jump? I, I forget if it was his idea or my idea. Like, I'll jump. He just said, I'm filling up the pool with dry ice. You want to come here? And I was like, dude, right on, man. Like, I'll jump off the damn roof. 
You know, I don't think it was necessarily his idea that I jump off the roof, but but yeah, it was David's cool. like say less. <laughs> yeah, great. You front flipped it off off it, right? I can't remember. You did. You did. Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. And you, yeah, but I, I waited until it dissipated enough that I could see the pool, which just makes me feel like a bitch. <laughs> well, you said you you talked about. I remember on the day you were like, "I do the three, two, one, and yeah. then I gotta go." Yeah. If you give yourself a countdown. Yeah, I've never backed down. That, and that still has one. never failed. The three, two, one. There's been times with skateboarding that um, kind of like because you don't make the trick. I've always committed. Yeah. You know, I've always committed. But skateboarding's been a, a tough. It's just it, it's tough to apply that to for skateboarding. Sure. But yeah, yeah. for the most part, like it's rock solid. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, with uh, three, two, one stunts and amends, wow. there, there's been tough amends where I got to go <laughs> acknowledge some crappy thing I did, and and it's it's a stunt. Same thing, you know, like you, you could. Like, it's uncomfortable. You're nervous. You dread doing it. Yeah. You're nervous. It could hurt you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, uh... And after, you feel fucking fantastic. And after, and yeah, and after you got this footage that you're so stoked, this footage is going to roll forever. Or, like, after an amends, yeah, you feel <sighs> so great. Like, it's really crazy, the uh, correlation. But those are the things that I do with the one, two, three, go. Isn't it amazing how revealing to an amends can be about... It can be so unclear where you stand or where the other person is with you and your life and your relationship. And if you do it, and you do it correctly, it almost, it's lovely and nice. And I would say the majority of the time when people are like, I love you, dude, it's okay. But if it doesn't happen, which is certainly yeah. possible, it reveals, it's not, I've never walked away from those situations going like, wow, I'm real, like, I'm real scum. I, I've always walked around away from those situations going like, oh man, there's, they've got something to work on themselves. Like, not like, uh, not putting anything on them, but I'm like, I did everything I could, so if they're still angry, like, it's their trip. There's nothing more for me to do. Yeah. Right. And that, it can be, it's it's interesting how we all process things differently. Yeah. Um, so with David Dobrik, and he just blows up and it's crazy, how active are you on your own YouTube? I think I just, I became, again, it was like this two-year span where I, Vine had gone away, Instagram had gone away, but I was so uh, um, sort of into this idea of whatever the next thing was, sort of conquering whatever that thing is, and so it became YouTube in longer form, and I remember you and I, when I had you on the podcast, like you had just started getting into it and you were like putting a team together. You screened one of your new videos yeah, right. at your house. And I'm like, and again, all of a sudden, it's not the people who are smart enough to get into it in 2015, right? It's like, now I have these people who I respect and look up to. Like, it's, the lines were blurring so quickly. And then all of a sudden, Kevin Hart has a show where everyone's in an ice bath. You know what I mean? Like, these people were coming in mass. So I wasn't afraid to lean in and try and find it. And I always talk about how I spent a year making videos that sucked and the views were dismal. And that was because I was surrounded by so many vloggers who were so good at it. They were masters at it and their audience was huge. And I was just trying to imitate what they were doing. But I never felt comfortable being the guy in the airport with the gigantic camera going like, What's up, Peck Nation? Like, <laughs> Do you have a Peck Nation? What's up, Peckers? <laughs> 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 What's up, Wolfpack? <laughs> We're getting on a Southwest flight to Tucson. Like, I just felt corny and people could feel that. And... That was just for me. And I remember a buddy of mine was like, listen, you've always made your, your career, your life, being in front of the camera. Let me hold the camera and worry about lighting and focus. You just try to be funny and think of something. So mukbangs were really popular during that time, which for anyone who doesn't know, it's like an eating show. It's all quiet and you just listen to the sound. It's where skinny people become fat for views. <laughs> <laughs> I go completely in reverse. <laughs> no, that's an ASMR. So mukbang, the idea with it, of it was like, basically you would eat something delicious and people would like get their dinner 
and they would watch the video while eating with you, right? So, but you were also trying things like trying everything on the Buffalo Wild Wings menu or like trying the new milkshakes from, yeah. it usually was something, you didn't see a lot of like tofu mukbangs. And, uh, <laughs> For sure. And so I'm like, I could do this. And I remember I did my first one and, uh, you know, and I'm eating Buffalo Wings and I'm, I'm talking shit and that video got 5 million views. Wow. And what? suddenly... I was like, oh, I found my lane. What's the demographics of a mukbang? The whole it's world. all over the place. People love it. Yeah. We're not not gangbangs. <laughs> <laughs> mukbang. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but like, like when you were looking at your YouTube demographics, what, what's the fucking... Uh, more female than male, but it was pretty down the middle. It took it. It was in. It was created in Korea, and it was really like there's a, there are real virtuous beginnings to it, which was this idea of like incredibly hardworking cultures where people a lot of times come home at eight o'clock at night and they're not having a big family to eat with, and they would love this idea that someone was eating with them, but then <laughs> oh, you could think of it like that. Yeah, yeah, like you could incorporate really delicious food. So then you're doing something that. Everybody wants to eat something delicious, but few people are allowing themselves, right? Or, like, maybe not few people, but most people are midweek on some kind of diet trying to be good. And you're like, well, I can enjoy it through them. So it was like an idiot's guide to life all of a sudden. And then it branched out to me and my buddy, you know, Jonah, trying, like, the hottest hot chicken or silly food-based stuff. But, yeah, that was kind of it, right? The Rock's cheat day once. I, like, ate all the food that The Rock eats, which... Wow. It's like 18 <clears throat> chocolate chip cookies and fucking... He's a wild kid. Everything but the tequila. But, I, yeah, I did everything that he ate, and it was... It crippled me. Did, did The Rock... Dwayne acknowledge you doing his cheat day? If he hasn't yet, he will. Is, it's, <laughs> it, how it's many the, views did that get? I think it did okay, like, uh, uh, just under a million. But, like, is The Rock the coolest Dwayne to ever exist? <laughs> yeah. I hear a lot of, like, ill Dwayne. Dwayne Wade's pretty sick. Dwayne's all... That's good, too. Yeah, I don't know any other Dwaynes, though. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I know a couple <laughs> lit Dwaynes. <laughs> um, so, what's going on with David Dobrik now? Um, I saw him a while back. Dobrik Pizza. He's, uh, yeah. yeah, the Dobricks. I saw him a while back, and he said that uh, he's not really doing YouTube anymore, but that he's, like, Super stoked on Snapchat. Like, yeah. Uh, is he doing long form Snapchat? I'm not sure. Are you on Snapchat? I have a I have a Snapchat programming where I just worry about making videos for YouTube, and yes. then I've got like this 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 guy who optimizes my YouTube content for both Snapchat programming and Facebook programming. Amazing. Yeah. And what do you feel? Because you're, I feel like a kinship with you, obviously, in so many ways. But to go, to truly have both, which few people can say, like, number one movies, massive TV shows, and then massive online uh, presence, is is there a preference? Is there one that's better for your overall Steve-O-hood? Like, um, what, do you, what do you think? Man, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I, I um, never learned how to edit footage properly until 2013 and you know up until that point I was at the mercy of the corporate powers that be how did know? that feel like uh, I mean it felt, felt fine you know like I, I had multiple shows like TV shows some with my name in the title like I had uh, you know, the number one movies like when like <laughs> I was out of control, I get sober, and like, I wasn't even necessarily ready to get back into entertainment, but entertainment beckoned me back, so there was never like a, you know, like a, I'm falling off kind of a thing, but then after Jackass 3D in 2010, I'm sober, like I'm, I'm getting into stand-up, uh, I just felt like the entertainment industry was done with me. You know, like, really? especially come 2013 when Knoxville was making the Bad Grandpa movie, which we didn't really know what it was. We, it was like, wait, hold on a second. Knoxville's making a jackass movie without us? You know, like, really? it felt like we were getting Timberlake. And was there any, like, we were, we were the Jackson 4. 
<laughs> Are you Chris Kirkpatrick? <laughs> um, I mean, there really wasn't a lot, you know, and, and I mean, whatever. Dude, this is all just perception and being sensitive and, and whatever. You right. Because like, Chris is a, sorry to interrupt, but Chris is a massive fan of all of it, right? I mean, as I've told you, I, I bought your Too Hot for TV DVD. Oh, so. man, I love that. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah, like, I, I ne- and I really enjoy Bad Grandpa, but never for a second did I think it was a jackass thing right. or that he had left you guys and learned right. like oh this is a side thing but clearly it-, it wasn't and we just didn't know and and Knoxville's always been like he's he's just not um like a braggart you know mm-hmm. like I'm always like I'm like if I I'll like text my press links to everybody I know <laughs> and that's oh just- you're that guy <laughs> <laughs> And I'm glad we're not that close. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not Knoxville. Sure. You know, sure, so sure. Knoxville's got something in the pipes. Like, he's not making a big deal out of it. Sure. And so, we just didn't know. You know, we didn't know. We found out about it in the press. And, and that's like, right. And, and, uh, and, 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 I mean, whatever. I just made a bigger thing out of it than it needed to be. And at the time, I was trying to pitch, like, some kind of TV show, and it was just nobody wanted it. And I just felt like everywhere, everything I was trying to make ha- happen, you know, I had this one TV show and, and uh, they replaced me as the host. Ugh. Like, um, I mean, that was, that was more because they said I wouldn't do anything with the animals anymore. And they were like, well, all we really have is, you know, animal gags. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I just felt like I was, like, like, I was discarded by Jackass. I was discarded by the one show I had. I was rejected by everything I was trying to do. And it was around that time my buddy Sam Macaroni was like, dude, you got to get on YouTube, man. I'm killing it on here. And he taught me how to edit. And, you know, it felt like a, a depressing demotion because, like, dude, I'm... I've had my own TV shows. I'm a number one movie guy. Like, not up- upload. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, and uh, I didn't even realize that it was, you know, wh- wh- what it could be. But but yeah. but getting into the digital space just brought about a, a resurrection. Yeah. It was a resur. It, it resurrected me. And um, everything that you said to yes. to take control, to have the power, to not need permission, to create my own content. So best thing that ever happened to me and and then whenever like the the traditional entertainment structure does call for me like with jackass forever it just puts a rocket ship on the other stuff i'm doing right you know so both are great i mean the the ultimate is to have both of them working in tandem (laughs) you know yeah um but but the, the thing about the digital space is that Yes, you you control your own creative. You create your own thing. You don't need permission. But God, it's so democratic. It's so transparent. It's so exposed. The analytics are just sitting right there to show if you're on the decline, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I was even saying this morning because I posted a video on, on YouTube that's just... 10, ranked 10 out of 10, you know, like just dying on there. And it's a banger video. It's crushing it on Facebook, mm. you know, like it's viral on Facebook. I feel like everything I'm putting on my main channel on YouTube is just... And and, and I told the guys this morning, I was like, you know what, man? Like, it feels kind of soul-crushing that uh, to, to put up a video you think is so awesome and then it's just dying on there. Mm. Just, but like what call it what comes to mind is emotional sobriety. Yes. Emotional sobriety. Like if I can if I can take this as a as a sign that I gotta like be less uh, attached um, my self worth, my self esteem to external validation, you know? Yeah. So I, I just can't I came over here, I was talking to Vinny, I'm like, you know what? Text my girl. I texted my girl, I said, uh, you know, I called it a long time ago before I met you, that if I didn't learn how to have a healthy relationship, that I was in for a dark and miserable future. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm so grateful for our love, and I want to grow old with you, and fuck everybody if they don't like what I think is awesome. 
That's huge. And how is she... Like, my wife won't even give me <clears throat> more than three minutes. Like, I'll be like, I'm going to need to really doom spiral right now. <laughs> so get the popcorn out. She'll be like, you got 90 seconds. <laughs> and then at the end of that, she'll be like, but you know it'll be all right, right? It's always been all right. And I'll be like, nah, no. <laughs> like, this time's different. <laughs> it's never going to be okay ever again. She's like, you know our kids are sleeping in the other room healthy and okay and like... Like we can, uh, like we can pump air conditioning all night if we want. Like we've got, like we're doing well. We lost <laughs> Do we... power. We lost power. Yeah. Sign. Sign went off. Did the road stop? Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder what. But it, it stopped at a perfect time, right when you said that. Yeah, not bad. Cameras are still running. Because they're running off batteries, dipshit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, it's there. I wonder why, why that even happened. There. I, I mean, I was, yeah. a long period of time. Let's see. Uh, the fucking air conditioning fucked us, Doug. How long was that running for on the road? Yeah, we were over an hour. So well, running, right, like yeah. so running the air conditioning for an hour. I wonder if it does that every time. Moby's went like an hour in a while. Yeah. Okay, that's back on. Turn that back on. We'll wrap it up. That didn't. No. Is that is that? Are we back on? File systems error has detected on your SD card. You should back up the files and reformat this. Okay. All right. So the whole thing's corrupted. Fucking idiot. Fucking idiot, dude. I mean, dude. Like I'm the one who bought the new fucking bigger air conditioner. Audio rolling. All right, we can pump air conditioning all night, except maybe not in the van because it all just shut down. That was crazy. It was yeah. a, the the the, the a sign. Yeah, it came at a good time though, man. Um, dude, I I uh, I respect you, man. I I like you. Same here, dude. I, uh, I appreciate you. I um, I relate to you. You know, I, like I I I think you're awesome, man. And 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 this was great. And I. Also think that we did a good job of making two totally separate podcasts that people can enjoy. I agree. Check it out. Good guys. So happy to be here with you. Yeah. Links and things and descriptions and it's but, an honor, boys. Yeah, it was Likewise. awesome meeting you. Feel happy to when we out. found out you were coming on, I was super stoked. I've been a fan for a long time. More than Moby. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, he Bobby, said no. He said yeah, no. Moby was great. Moby yeah, was great. Was awesome. Moby, was really Moby awesome. was sick. Moby, yeah, yeah, yeah. Moby's a hard body vegan. Huh? He doesn't mess around. Hard body, Wait, dude. Is, is Moby vegan? Yeah. <laughs> 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 hey man, I love, love you, you Thank, yeah. you. Thank you, dude. <laughs> dude. I'm sitting here in England that we got here today and I'm pretty hammered by jet lag right now, dude. Um, but man, what a, what a likable guy Josh Peck is. I, re I really enjoy him. Um, it's a double upload. So head on over to his podcast to see the recording with, with me to listen to it. Um, yeah, dude. Uh, and, and if you're in England, man, the UK, Check out the bucket list tour out here. Plus, I'm taping my special, the bucket list special, in London at the Hackney Empire, July 13th and 14th. Super stoked about it, man. No, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs>